The United States of America is the leader in AI, and our administration plans to keep it that way. So what could the prize of winning the race in the so-called fourth industrial revolution be? What could it do for productivity and therefore economic growth? And who stands to benefit? We posed those questions to Dr. Jeffrey Hinton, who won the Nobel Prize for his work on large language models and is often called the godfather of AI. It will be a wonderful thing for productivity, that's true. Whether it be a wonderful thing for society is something else altogether. In a decent society, if you increase productivity a lot, everybody's better off. But here what's going to happen, if you increase productivity a lot, the rich and the big companies are going to get much richer and ordinary people are probably going to be worse off because they'll lose their jobs. AI's ability to drive productivity could give new life to economies whose productivity has stalled. U.S. productivity grew at only 1.5% a year for 20 years and then shot up to 2.7% in 2023. And economists anticipate that widespread adoption of AI could keep the momentum going, with Goldman Sachs expecting AI to be a key driver of productivity growth in developed economies in particular. When wider adoption does come, Hinton says it won't come equally to all involved. It will have very different effects on different parts of the workforce. Many people say, you know, um, it'll create more jobs. For this particular thing, I'm not convinced of that. What we're doing in the Industrial Revolution, we made human strength irrelevant. Now we're making human intelligence irrelevant. And that's very scary. So there's some areas where demand is very elastic. An example would be healthcare. If I could get 10 hours a week talking to my doctor, I'm over 70, I'd be very happy. So if you take someone and make them much more efficient by having them work with a very intelligent AI, they're not going to become unemployed. It's not that you're now only going to need a few of them. You're just going to get much more healthcare. Great. So in elastic areas, it's great. But for all the talk of AI's sweeping effects, economic change has been slow to materialize. That same Goldman report says that only 5% of companies claim to use generative AI in regular production, with tech and information businesses leading the way. Whatever hurdles may hold us back in the race to AI, it doesn't look like it will be for lack of spending. AI spending by four of America's biggest tech companies surged 63% last year and should rise even higher this year. Chris Miller is the author of Chip War. He says the challenge for big tech companies isn't the money being spent, but lack of capacity. There are two limiting factors right now. One is the chips and servers themselves, which are less in shortage than they were 18 months ago, but are still uh, hard to come by for some of the biggest tech firms and the vast quantities that they need. The second hurdle, which is new, is actually the power to make uh, the data centers function the way they need to. They need huge quantities of power, and as AI gets more advanced, it requires bigger and bigger data centers. And so now if you listen to companies like OpenAI or Google, they're talking about bringing online data centers that use a gigawatt of power. You need a whole power plant to power some of these facilities, and it just takes time to build all that infrastructure. For some time, chip manufacturing capacity has been concentrated in Southeast Asia. That began to change with the Biden administration's Chips and Science Act, encouraging investment in U.S. chip manufacturing. Samsung is investing in a chip plant in Texas, while TSMC is opening a new plant in Arizona. Alyssa Apsel is the director of electrical and computer engineering at Cornell University. The Chips Act is a response to a COVID-era supply chain interruptions that made it very, very clear that the U.S. needs to be competitive in semiconductors. Otherwise, we're going to lose out to other countries because we can't supply our own semiconductors and we'll be beholden to other countries to supply them for us. And that that puts us in a precarious position in terms of national security. The infusion of funding into the U.S., both on the research side and uh, for companies to, to develop products, but also for small companies to be able to compete in this space uh, in order to support growing this infrastructure has been like 
quite significant, uh, and it's really changed the game in this space. Building more chip making and power plants is one way to get over the AI capacity hurdles. Another could be finding ways to achieve the benefits of AI without requiring the same supplies of chips or energy. Wall Street was rattled in recent weeks by a new, more efficient AI model out of China. I think in Silicon Valley, there was actually a lot of surprise as to why DeepSeek garnered so much attention in the media and on Wall Street. DeepSeek was uh, part of the AI conversation for most of the last half of 2024, and then just in the past couple of weeks, it uh, gathered attention in, in the media and in Wall Street. I think what you'd find is that uh, compared to OpenAI or compared to Anthropic, the number of paying customers is far, far lower. And that's where the U.S. firms appear to have a real advantage. They've already got the distribution channels. They've already got the uh, market reputation to be the real leaders in AI. Certainly, they've got, they've got high-quality technology, but they've also got uh, these other factors in their business model, which give them a real head start vis-a-vis -vis DeepSeek. And so if you ask yourself, what will DeepSeek's revenue be in six months' time? from paying subscribers outside of China, I would bet that number is going to be pretty low. Is there any prospect that we could engineer or innovate our way out of the problem? That is to say, reduce the need for the computing capacity by really re-engineering, as it were, uh, generative AI? Well, we've seen plenty of efforts to make AI more efficient, in part because it requires so much extraordinarily expensive computing infrastructure. And the trend has been that for a given quality of AI system, it does get a lot more efficient over time. If you look, for example, at the price it costs to use a GPT-3 model, the type of model that was released a handful of years ago by OpenAI, we've seen a, a two order of magnitude decrease in the price of using that model. So huge efficiency gains. But the problem is that we also get better models that require more computing. And the trend line over the last couple of years has been that the advances we gain from harnessing more computing power and throwing all that at the, pro at the problem of AI dramatically outweigh the efficiency gains. And so long as the rate of innovation remains so rapid and that innovation is catalyzed by computing power, the efficiency gains are going to be outpaced by the capability and the computing needs of these new models. That's certainly the trend right now. It's also the trend that all of the world's big tech companies are betting on. That's why Amazon, Meta, Microsoft, and others are building these vast data center complexes, because they're betting that capabilities gains enabled by more computing will be the dominant feature in AI for the rest of the decade. Economists talk about something called the Jivons paradox that came out of coal usage. That the more efficient you got using coal, there was just more demand for coal, more applications of it. Uh, do we have that prospect that essentially, as far as I can see, we're never going to catch up the supply of chips with the demand? I think it's exactly that. <laughs> um, I think that, that the more, at least from, from where I stand today, I don't know that this is always going to be true, but like in the foreseeable future, I don't see that we're going to say, oh, okay, now I have twice the processing power, that's enough. Um, I think we'll wind up pushing more applications and developing more utility and finding kind of new spaces where we need AI or new types of jobs for it to do um, that require more and more processing and just ride that curve in that direction. AI and automation can have unintended consequences. The race to win the prize in artificial intelligence is well and truly on. But some of those who understand the power of AI best warn that we need to make sure it's not just a fast race, but a safe one. That we need to build capacity, not just to drive large language models, but to make sure that they do what we want them to. Can governments keep up? And how do they regulate something that's advancing so quickly? There are good people in the government, smart people, some probably less smart. smart. But are they up to the job of really understanding what you're talking about and getting their arms around it. We need many of the smartest young researchers to be working on this problem, and we need them to have resources. Now, the government doesn't have the resources. The big companies have the resources. The government, I think, should be insisting that the big companies spend much more of their resources on safety, on this safety research of how will we stay in control compared with what they do now. Right now, they spend like a few percent on that, and nearly all their resources go into building even better, bigger models. They should be spending a much bigger fraction on safety, and the government could try and mandate that. So there was a bill in California that the governor recently vetoed that would have gone a little bit in that direction. But of course, big companies don't want that. Big companies want to be free to make profits. That's the system we're in. 
And so if you take Sam Altman, for example, OpenAI was initially very concerned about safety. As time's gone by, it's got less and less concerned about safety. Sam Altman still says he's concerned with safety. But if you look at what he does and not what he says, he's turning it into a pure for-profit company. Um, there's far less resources spent on safety. And most of the leading safety researchers, who were kind of the best in the world at OpenAI, have left. So to prevent that kind of thing happening, we need government. Governments are the only thing powerful enough to prevent that. Maybe they're not even powerful enough. Um, they should force the big companies to provide resources for safety research. As you say, big companies don't like to be told by the government how to spend their money, but they are often. I mean, you have big accounting departments, for example, to comply with various regulatory requirements on accounting. Uh, if the government were to say, yes, we're going to, at least for the very largest tech firms involved in AI, mandate a percentage of your revenue that will be devoted towards safety, what's the right number? I'm not sure that's the right thing to go for. It shouldn't be a percentage of the revenue because that's very complicated and they put all the revenue in some other country and cheat. The thing to go for is a fraction of their computing resources. The bottleneck here is computing resources. How many NVIDIA chips or how many Google Tensor chips can you get? It should be a fraction of the computing resources. What that's fraction? an easier thing to measure. What fraction? I think it would be perfectly reasonable to say a third. Now that's my starting point and I'd settle for a quarter.